who have not been in obedience to the God Almighty, the Father of all spirits, the one who is love. And that is the reason why we are here today to just say that we exalt that name because only that name can save. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the aroma of your presence. We thank you for the beauty of your holiness and the splendor of your love. As we continue today in worship, as we continue even in this segment of listening to your word and receiving that which your Holy Spirit is saying unto the churches, may we, Lord, be illuminated on the inside and be radiant on the outside. Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, may we be enlightened within and confident on the outside. Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, may we be healed within and strong on the outside. Let your word do what it does. Bring healing in this place today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. And as I stand, Lord, you reminded me today that I stand here as a witness of the truth. Because a true witness, the word of God says, will deliver the souls of the captive. Anyone who is in need of deliverance today will be delivered at the word of the witness, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Alrighty. Praise God. We really celebrate you guys. That was awesome. That was, that was phenomenal. Yeah, I know that we had a couple of people who came around the stage, but I can tell that more people wanted to come here and sit next to Johnny. He was that good. Um, and I'm just so thankful to God, you know, because, you know, you go to some environments and they're like, uh, like 150 youth up front jumping and clapping and everything becomes electrified just because of all of the emotion in the room. But without having all of that kind of... Um, exuberance, we are still able to enjoy a tangible presence of God. And I think what really matters is for us to be able to do it in a setting like this, so that wherever we are, we understand the heart of praise and the heart of worship. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty. Uh, these guys, most of y'all want here on Saturday. Um, I wish we could say that we missed y'all, but Joshua and Emmanuel, they brought it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, but we're happy to see you again anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if we didn't miss you, it's Emmanuel. Yeah. All righty. God is good. All righty. Praise the Lord. So today, very quickly, we will take a look at um, a verse of scripture in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45. Pray for Emmanuel. Isaiah 45, verse 2. What does it say? It says, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I like the other reference to this activity of God that says, I will cut the bars of iron asunder. That means not only am I going to cut it, but I'm going to make it asunder, which means I'm going to neutralize it completely. I will what? Neutralize it completely. I remember that back in the day, there was a sorcery in the town where my mom and dad were raised, a sorcerer. And this particular sorcerer uh, was so skilled in the art of sorcery to the point wherein he actually messed with his natural self. So he couldn't function properly anymore and he was regarded as a lunatic. People believe that it was one of those out of body experiences wherein they used all kinds of incantations to project themselves out of their body. They call it astral projection. And he couldn't make it back into his body collectively. And so he couldn't really function. But what happened was on one of those shows that they put up because people knew that everyone in town was fascinated by his magic and sorcery. Even in his lunatic state, they would bind him with chains and all kinds of things. And he would begin to recite incantations. And his method of operation was very simple. What he was skilled at doing was he had learned the names of elements in the realm of the spirit, such that when he starts to call elements by their name, it will command them. And so he will command all the elements in the metal that was, the chain was made of, and they will dissolve and it will come out of it. And so when my mom was telling us the story, one of the things that occurred to me was that, wait a minute, if somebody who is 
operating on stolen power. Right? Because remember that we learned from the accounts of Enoch that some of the fallen ones, some of the watchers were the ones who taught humanity. They taught them the secret of the elements so that they can command elements and make them to perform all kinds of lying wonders. So I thought to myself, if this was not the real, if this is not the real deal, whatever this guy was doing was, 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 was not the real deal. How much more when we lay hold of the true power? You understand what I mean? Even though those folks were fascinated by what he was doing, I wasn't fascinated by what I was hearing. If anything at all, it motivated me to look forward to more. You understand what I mean? Because again, when, the, when some of the archangels re reported Azazel and Samiazar and the rest of those guys who broke rank, uh, the ones that the Bible was talking about in Jude chapter 1, uh, verse 6, saying that they left their original habitation. Jude was only summarizing, like I told you on Saturday, when you look at the book of Enoch that Jude was quoting from, uh, because Jude was one of the guys that he would quote Enoch verb, verb, verbatim, word for word. He would quote like two verses together, almost the whole passage. And so when he was talking about those guys who left their original estate, the full account says that the archangels went to God and said to God, we, they call God the, the Lord of all spirits. And said, so they said, Lord of all spirits, we know that you know all things. But when are you going to do something about these guys seeing how they corrupt the face of the earth? And the Lord of all spirits, the father of us all, said, why are you concerned about them? They are only operating on what we refer as base most knowledge in heaven. He said, they don't even have the true knowledge of how heaven runs. He says, don't worry about them. They will have what is coming to them. And so when you put it all in perspective, whatever it is that you see the enemy operating with, it is just the base most, the, the very basic fundamental knowledge of how things run in glory. But to you and I, the Bible says that we have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. God did not limit he did not put a limit on the things of heaven that we have access to. So we are the ones that are supposed to be operating in such powers. And God is not holding power back from us because he doesn't love us. No, he's, he's allowing us to go through this phase of existence wherein we are learning how to handle power. Remember the disciples because after having rubbed shoulders with Jesus, you know, they were hanging out with Jesus all the time. They started to feel the power. They started to feel like they could operate in the power. And they had read about Elijah and the rest of them who would call down fire from heaven. And on one occasion, they said to Jesus, they said, do you want us to just call down power? They weren't saying that because they were fantasizing. They were feeling the power. And Jesus was like, if you know who you are, you're not even going to do that. And so God is waiting for a time that we would allow ourselves to enjoy the fullness of the tutelage of the Holy Spirit, to come to a point wherein we know who we are. In Proverbs chapter 14, the Bible says, a man of wisdom or the wisdom of the prudent is to know by himself who he is. Right? The wisdom of the prudent is to know who he is. And so if we do not know who we are, we have yet to attain the kind of wisdom that commands the power and the authority of heaven. Look at what Alan reminded us of. He read from the book of Matthew. Is it Matthew chapter 8 verse 16 that you read from? When the Bible says that Jesus, one word, he would speak one word and pretty much every demon in the room will excuse him. Just one word. And when the Pharisees saw that, because the Pharisees, some of them were uh, what you call um, exorcists, people who casted out demons. Yeah, but they would use all kinds of, um, they used to use what they call parables. So they would gather a set of parables, which were essentially stories to remind evil spirits of why they do not have access. So it's almost like going to a law court. They, they, their, ex, their exorcism or exorcism was done as a form of litigation wherein they would negotiate with evil spirits and sometimes they would have to make compromises and offer this and offer that up just so that they can leave the people. So when Jesus came and he would speak one word and the demons would flee, they were like, by what wisdom does he do these things? Why did they say that? Because the last person who casted out demons like that was Solomon. And Solomon declared to the people that he was doing it by wisdom. 
When you read the book of the wisdom of Solomon, what you will find is that Solomon had authority over the spirits because he, he was given the authority. It was recorded that a signet ring was given to him by the angel of the Lord with which he was able to command evil spirits and even get them to do his bidding. And so when you look at it, what does it take? Two people in recorded scripture operated like that before Jesus went to the cross and they did it by wisdom. They didn't say by what magical power, they didn't say by what authority or what wisdom because they know that only wisdom or wisdom alone can deliver that kind of authority. And so wisdom is when we come to know who we are and then we learn also to mind our business. You understand what I mean? Yeah, we need to learn to mind our business. In fact, it's one of the things that the Holy Spirit's been impressing upon my heart lately. You know that last, on, on Saturday when my wife came up here, maybe Saturday or, yeah, it must be Saturday. Yeah, I think it was the last time she was up here to lead prayer. She said that Jesus, whenever people report others to Jesus, so if you go to report somebody to Jesus, Jesus would not address whoever you're reporting. He will address you. And he did that every single time. When they brought the woman who was caught in adultery to Jesus, Jesus was not addressing the woman who was caught in adultery. He addressed all the other people standing. He was like, okay, I see what you're doing. He who amongst you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And the Bible says from the least of them to the greatest, they all went away shamefully. You understand what I mean? When Martha came to report Mary to Jesus, to say, oh Lord, do you not see my sister? Aren't you supposed to rebuke her and correct her for being so insolent, for not doing what she's supposed to do? Jesus looked at Martha and said, Martha, Martha, you are the one with the issue. He said to Martha, he says, why are you bothered about all these things when one thing is needful? You see, the reason, one of the reasons why we're not fully operating in the power just yet is because God knows that we're still busy bodies. If he gave us the power with which we're supposed to be made perfect, the Bible says he has given gifts to men. For what reason? For the perfection of the saint and for the edifying of the body. Instead of trying to perfect yourself with the power that he has given to you, you want to perfect somebody else. If God gave you the power now, you want to apply the power on other people and that is a destructive process because the way God works on us is from the inside out. But if you give us power, we want to fix people from the outside in. Let me, let me give you an example. Somebody that you, you know, you don't like them because you think they talk too much. And the way God wants to fix them is God wants to fix the heart first because it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. But what do you want to do? You want power to be able to create a zipper on their lips that you have the remote control to. There are some men who, like, who would like to have that because they can't out talk their wives and when the wives are talking, they feel outdone and, and they just want to shut the woman up one way or the other. If it, in, and in reality, what men are supposed to do, except he's a nagging wife, of course, but if it's just a wife that is talking a lot, is to listen because a lot of wisdom comes when they speak. I said, of course, when it's not a nagging wife. You understand what I mean? Because there is a difference, yeah? There is a difference between an enlightening wife and a nagging wife. Even though some people believe that the word nagging itself is subjective. But story for another day, while we're still not in trouble, let's keep going. But I tell you what, it is interesting because of the fact that we are getting ready to receive the power. We've had a couple of warnings here and there, you know, that there are certain things that must not be heard of amongst us because of the fact that the power is coming. And when the power comes, it is power undiluted. You see, it's not the kind of power that you mess with. And so God in his love is not allowing for us to experience the power just yet because we're still being worked on. Remember the early church, the people who had presented themselves before the Lord continually, waiting for the reception of, waiting for the baptism of the, not baptism, waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit. And I like to choose those words carefully because when we're growing up, they used to mix everything up. You know, what happened on the day of Pentecost wasn't particularly the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they were receiving the power. 
you see, that comes with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself was the one who baptized them with the Holy Spirit, just as John said. John said, the one that comes after me is not just going to baptize you with water, but it will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. So you have the three elements, the water, the fire, and the wind. He says he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and Jesus made sure that nobody came after him to introduce a different baptism. So he baptized his disciples before he got into that cloud that took him into glory. The Bible says he laid his hands on the disciples and he breathed on them and he said to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Does it make sense? You see, because if we don't think about it that way, then you have people telling you stories of how they were just sitting in their bedroom and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is done by the laying on of hands, just as Jesus did it to others. Now, do you manifest all of the gifts the moment they lay hands on you? Not necessarily. You may be sitting in your home afterwards, but there needs to be that chain of custody so as not to allow room for false spirits to pretend to be the Christ and give you a baptism outside of that chain of command. Does it make sense? You know, because we've heard, we've heard stories of people who just claim to be suddenly born again on their own and, and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit on their own without being discipled. When Jesus says, make disciples of men, there needs to be a person that links you to the person who links them, that links them, links them, links them in the experience of salvation and baptism back to Jesus. Alrighty, but once they link you to Jesus, so to speak, their work is done because now they no longer remain a middleman between you and him, but they are supposed to be there as facilitators. And God designed it in such a way so that another one is not introduced to us. And what I'm telling you has caused a lot of problems in the world simply because when you look at the Muslim nation, the Muslims believe that the help that Jesus promised was Muhammad. You see, they believe that very strongly that when Jesus says, I, I will send you another comforter, that that is him. You see what I mean? And there is no way they would have known that if not that some sellouts within the so-called church gave them the doctrines and gave them an opportunity to build around it, even using Angel Gabriel as the deliverer of the message. But story for another day, but I want you to know that if we don't understand these principles, then we will make room for the devil. And the Bible says, make no room for Satan. All right. So all the people who had persevered with Jesus while he was here on earth, who went through his water baptism, you know, because sometimes we forget that after Jesus left John, Jesus also went and he did his own water baptisms. And then just so, so as to fulfill all of what was, uh, all of which, all of that which was said. So he did all of that baptism, uh, baptisms. And then when he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, Father, we thank you. Ah, Praise the Lord. You know, there is a city that the Bible says is sitting upon seven hills. In the natural, we know what that city is, but I've given them enough of a hard time in recent times. So I'm going to give them a break today. I would not mention their name, but there is a prominent city in the world that sits on seven hills. And I see, just as I was standing over there, the hills have been uprooted. Father, I thank you. You see, the hills are being uprooted. And so the shaking that is going on on the earth that we're seeing in the natural is an insight into what is happening in the supernatural. Babylon, the great, is being uprooted as we speak. Father, we thank you because indeed, this is the reason why the Holy Spirit brought me here because I was like, I'm not even going to ask. He just said to me, Isaiah 45 verse 2, and when you look at it, what does he say? He says, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. The undulating places, that's what it means. The crooked places, the undulating places. So that the seven hills will pass for crooked places. He said, I will make them straight. That means he would level them. He says, I will break in pieces the gates of bronze. Those gates that have kept us out of the fullness of what God has for us. You see, they've been holding and sitting over materials that will help the edifying of the body. The Bible says all scripture was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it is for the young, for the, for the, for the men of God to be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And there are some gates that have been keeping us out of some of these good and godly scriptures. And the Bible says that is just an example of some of the things that have been keeping us out of. I just can't stop looking at what I am seeing. 
the hills are being operated. The Holy Spirit said to me on Saturday, that was the reason why he said to us to read Romans chapter 1 verse 20, that from the visible elements of this world, we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of eternal powers. Remember that from that moment, we, we, have, begun, we have begun to see certain shaking going on on the earth. All of the earthquakes and all of that good stuff that happened, uh, I say good stuff, even though, you know, lives have been taken, lives have been lost, people's livelihoods have been with, withheld and all of that stuff. But we say good stuff because whenever the word of God is being fulfilled, it is a good thing, right? Even though men may not agree with it, but it is still a good thing, you know, because when God allows for certain things to be removed that people have gotten used to, people complain, but God is waiting to give us something better. You understand what I mean? The children of Israel, when God took them out of the land of Egypt and they no longer had the garlic that they had had access to and the wine and the meat, what did they say? The Bible says grown men lifted up their voices and wept because of garlic and honey and, 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 honey, and onions. Grown men. Can you, can you just imagine how spoiled they were? I know that I'm a spoiled child of God, but I'm not that spoiled. I don't think so. Even though sometimes I still lift up my voice and wail over nothing, but I mean, onions and garlic, come on. So they lifted up their voices and wailed because God was taking that away from them. But what did he have for them in place of that? A land that was flowing with milk and honey. You understand what I mean? And so we see that people would whine and complain. But when you see these things, Daniel warned us, the Lord warned us through the ministry of Daniel. What did he say? He said to Daniel, tell them when everybody is saying there's a casting down. Tell my people not to join them. They need to say there is a lifting up. Three, four months ago, what did the Lord say to us? I was here and the Lord showed me a flood that was coming from the heavens. It's, it, it didn't even look like rain. It was like the monsoon. It was huge. Do people use the word monsoon here to describe rain that is very heavy? Yeah, it was like the monsoon. He was coming down very heavily. And the Lord revealed to me that the same rain that will drown and wash away the enemy is the same that would lift us up. Just like in the days of Noah, it was the same waters that washed the wickedness away that lifted the righteous. And so let us not join them. I know that there is a part of us that want to be all sympathetic, but we are soldiers who are at war and we cannot sympathize unduly with the judgment that God has upon the wicked. And God told us, he says, with your eyes, you will behold the reward of the wicked. So what are you going to do about it? You weep and cry that God is finally eliminating the ones that have kept you behind the bronze gates who have held your possession behind the bars of iron. No, we do not wail. What we do is we wait because our rejoicing is about to be taking up a notch. Praise the Lord. Now, I haven't said that. Um, I want to say something. Uh, it's just like, but the hills have been uprooted. I wish you could see what I see. But the hills have been uprooted. And the Lord is saying, as it happened in the natural, wherein their structures, the structures that they have erected will be pulled down. I mean, were pulled down in the natural. They would also be pulled down sociologically, politically, technologically, and also in the world of business. We are about to receive the Lord of glory who is coming here to establish his administration of peace that would allow us for the very first time in a long time to truly shine as children of God, when righteousness prevails in every aspect of our lives. Isn't that going to be awesome? And it's not going to take us long when we're talking about a couple of years of, of full restoration. Praise the Lord. So I'm, I'm going to say this very quickly because I just want to get it out of the way. Remember that a couple of weeks ago, there was a cloud that was seen over Turkey. Remember that red cloud? that looked like blood, right? And when that cloud appeared, the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, go in the comments and you see people trying to explain it away. And I saw them, they were trying to explain it away. They said, oh, this is a rare occurrence. It happens only once every, maybe like one million years, some kind of ridiculous number like that. You know, they keep making all these things up when you're like, really? When you ask them, why is the sky blue? They tell you the sky is blue because the particles of... Um, uh, there are certain particles in the atmosphere uh, that are blue and they're the same size 
as the blue light that is in the spectrum of the light of the sun. And so in the daytime, it looks blue. And then at night, it looks red because the sun runs out of blue particles. No, no, I'm telling you, that is the most scientific explanation. And it was named after some British guy. They call him Lord something. He was knighted because of that foolishness. They said the sun, by evening, runs out of blue light. Because, you know, light is made up of seven colors. White light is made of seven colors, which is because there are seven spirits of God. And God is light. So it has to be like that in the natural, wherein you have red uh, what what are they, those colors again? And help us out. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. You see what I mean? It has to be seven colors. If it's six colors, it's the number of rebellion. It's the color of rebellion. You see, when people brandish six colors in your face, what they are saying is they are operating by the spirit of the animal, the spirit of man. All animals were made on the sixth day. So the spirit of bestiality is six, whereas seven is the number of the spirits of God. So don't, don't let your children go collecting toys that have six colors on them. They're not accidental. The factories did not run out of paint. People are being deliberately, they've been deliberate and they deliberately use only six colors. So when your children say, oh, I'd like to buy that, tell them, no, if it's not seven, you ain't having it because we do not want you to continue to pay for the sacrifices that have been offered in, this, in the temple of Ashtoreth. No, that's not what we do, okay? So we, we put our money where our mouth is, you see? So we, 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 we spend in accordance with what we believe. We're not here to empower other people who are in opposition to God. Does it make sense? And those emblems are not even supposed to be carried by us because indeed God gave us the full seven. Why do we want to sell ourselves short and not elevate to the level of a human being born again and reborn according to the similitude of Christ? Why do we want to settle for bestiality? And so... Those seven colors, I just give that as an example. They said the sun. I mean, that doesn't even make any sense, right? Because the sun doesn't just run out of light because it shines all the time. If you're not seeing it here, that doesn't mean it's run out of power. Some people are seeing it. And so if the sun is red, if the sky is red because the sun's run, run out of blue color, how come the other guys in California who are just seeing it three hours after you still see that it is blue? Oh, maybe he saved them some blue light. You understand what I mean? And so we've been through all of that and that's what they're doing. And so when we saw the blue, uh, when we saw the red cloud over Turkey, it was supposed to have been a very clear sign to the inhabitants of the land that the earthquake will follow. Because, say that again, they've been seeing more of the same red cloud yeah, anybody who sees that red cloud needs to move very quickly. You see what I mean? Because that was what Joel said. The Bible in, in the book of jo, Joel or Joel chapter 2, he started to describe a particular kind of cloud that he saw. And it's interesting because he says the cloud is going to be what? A mixture of blood, of smoke, and the clouds. And that was what we saw. We saw blood. And the tail end of it looked like smoke because it was, it continued infinitely like smoke and it had the color of blood. And he says, after that, he says, the earth will quake, the nations will be shaken, the lands will be divided and the great day of the Lord will come shortly afterwards and it will be a terrible day for the wicked. Do you understand what I mean? And so we're like, okay, we saw it, but they tried to explain it away you know, telling us all kinds of fibs, right? Now, that was an outright lie because they lied. But what did I tell you on Saturday? The next move of the enemy is such that they will not lie, but the facts that they present would actually be untrue. Now, I know that could be kind of confusing. Even myself, I told Brother Matthew, I said, I had to go back to the Lord. I said, okay, uh, I want to make sure that I understand what you said, you know, because... It wasn't me who was saying it. You said it. I'm just a mouthpiece. The Bible says, let him who speak, speak as an oracle of God. The easiest thing in life is don't try to make anything up on behalf of God. Say what he says. You understand what I mean? It's so easy. The Bible says a false witness is an abomination, but the one who hears speaks expressly. Why? Because the true witness will bring deliverance, whereas anybody who speaks of his own accord will cause strife. So what do we do? 
if the Holy Spirit says that is what is happening, that is what is happening. Even if I don't fully get it at that particular point in time. The reason why many of us are not fully functioning in the gifts of the word of knowledge or word of wisdom is because what the Holy Spirit is inspiring in you, you are debating the logic behind what he says. You understand what I mean? No, if the Lord says it, he can defend himself. You understand what I mean? If that's what the Lord is saying, that's it. Just give the word. You understand what I mean? You know, anyway, that is how it works. Let's, let's not give too many examples. But I went to the Holy Spirit and I said, even I want to understand better. And he said to me, he said, okay, in the past, when there are unidentified flying objects, they would say that it's unidentified. Sometimes they will say, oh, maybe there's a, a military station that is testing or a military contract or is testing something new or another country is trying to spy on us. They will say all kinds of things. Those are outright lies, right? But the next move is they will come out and say, yeah, we've identified what is in the air and they are actually aliens from somewhere else. They're not from here. They are the ones that are flying. And it's okay, all right. So they're not lying now because they are telling you, but the identity of the ones is false. So that is what it means. The mouthpieces will not lie about what they know, what's been revealed to them, but even though they are speaking, that which they are speaking is a lie. Okay, simply because of the fact that the identity of the people that will come to penetrate this realm has already been revealed to us in scripture. And I'm going to show you too, very quickly who those people are and how powerful they are. They're coming with an advanced technology that would allow for them to be able to withstand every kind of equipment that we have. The Bible says that men will throw all kinds of things at them and they will keep going. It will not even move them. Nothing will be able to stop them. Anyway, let me quit trying to uh, replay it to you. Let's read it together from the book of Joel. And I want to just to, and I just want us to look at it very quickly so that we're equipped because people will start to uh, fall for the next round of tricks on their faces. Whereas instead of being terrified as men will be, we are supposed to recognize that this is the Lord at work. All righty. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Yeah, it's right here somewhere. All righty. Some of those books are so close to each other that you still have to sing the song to remember where they're at. Unless, of course, your brother Matthew. All righty, let's go. The Bible says in Joel chapter 2, and um, I just want to say this, that um, um, pray for anybody that you know in France. Okay, because France, they've had their own warning. You know, there was a cloud that appeared over France. And when I saw the cloud, uh, what came to my, it looked like internal organs of the human being. And so pray for them because um, I don't want to be too graphic, but just pray for them. You know, it's not, it's not a good thing to see internal organs as a sign of what may befall a nation. You know, because that could look very terrible. Just imagine all kinds of things that would happen to people internally, um, especially if it happens to an entire nation. But just pray for the believers. The Bible says pray uh, uh, for all men with all manners of prayers, but there are times wherein we are told to specifically pray for the saints. Okay, and this is one of those times where we're specifically meant to pray for the saints. Uh, so if you know anybody in France, just pray for them. If I not just France, a lot of Western Europe has been seeing a display of what to expect because when the Bible says these things will be in the heavens as a sign, it is followed usually by what happens on the earth. So there is a sign first of what's coming so that no one is, so that you are without excuse. Does it make sense? Turkey is a perfect example. They saw the blood and the smoke and what happened eventually? The blood and the smoke because when the earth quakes and opens up like that, there is smoke that comes from the ground, mingles with the blood of men and there is a cloud of dust. Everything that you see there happens on the ground. You see what I mean? And so that is the reason why when we see these things, we do not take them for, for granted. We know exactly how to pray so that we're not just praying for people after it happens, okay? And again, I'm here and there, but I'm, I, there's a reason. 
Because the Bible says we cannot afford to be ignorant. Remember the other day there was a football player that fell down on the, pool, on, the, on the field of play and people started to pray. And I got on social media and I saw that everybody was praying. And immediately I knew something was off. And I'm like, okay, this is not how Christians pray. We don't pray when the world is praying. Or we don't pray when the world tells us to pray. You understand what I mean? Prayer is very sacred. It's our most powerful tool. You know, one of our most powerful tools, and we just don't brandish it anywhere, anytime, because somebody says to brandish it. It's like, you know, having your neighbor's kid come to your house and say, hey, can you bring your daddy's gun and let's play with it? No, that's not what it's for. You see? So these things are very sacred. Uh, but everybody started praying, and then I heard, in fact, in incidentally, somebody did a kind of compilation of several pulpits on Sunday, saying, oh, look at how we're starting off the year 2023. America is praying. And I'm like, come on. Come on. Praying for what? Open your eyes and see what you're praying about. We were experiencing a full-blown satanic ritual. They were doing the ritual of the rebirth to exalt another being in the hierarchy of evil. All the signs were there. They set up the pillars. Oh, oh, oh. Everything was there and I'm like, you just have to open your eyes. And if you are not seeing, open your heart. At least you must be able to discern. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. We're not supposed to take a lead from the world. The moment TV presenters, the same people who have spoken lies for years, they suddenly now start saying they want to pray. Aren't you supposed to examine their fruits first before you follow them? Jesus says, many will come in my name, but by their fruits you shall know them. The moment they pray, I stop praying. Because uh, whatever they say, if they say go left, I'm going right. If they say jump, I'll sit down. If they say sit down, I will run as fast as I can. Simply because the Bible says they are the ones who will call that which is evil good and that which is good evil. They are of their father, the devil. Who is the father of lies? You know, and Jesus said it. Jesus said even when Satan was in heaven, he couldn't help himself. Iniquity was found in him. Can you imagine being in heaven around the throne of God and you are thinking evil all the time? It was said by Jesus himself that Satan could not help himself, that even in heaven around the throne of God, he lied. How, did, how, how could he have convinced a third of the angels to follow him? He lied. Because if he told them the truth about what he was going to do, they would have arrested him and taken him to God and said, see what this dude is trying to get us to do. And so when you see people that are operating, now let me tell you something, a news reporter can get born again. But when you get born again, you don't keep going to the same altars wherein you have been worshiping. When you get born again, you come out of them. One of the things that disqualifies people entry into the or participation in the kingdom of God is for them to attempt to operate the kingdom of God as they did in the world. Remember Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer obtained the knowledge of sorcery by paying for it. And then when he got born again, because the Bible says amongst them who believed and were saved was Simon who was a sorcerer. So the Bible, his testimony was that he believed and he was saved. But he did not allow himself to be converted. You know, the Bible says that you will believe and be converted. Believing can happen in an instant. But conversion takes a process. Romans chapter 12 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. The people who manifest sudden change after they get born again are the people whose vices were purely as a result of demonic activity. So when they get born again and the demons leave, if it's a born again that happens with full deliverance, then they stop smoking, they stop their addiction to things. That is not conversion. That is deliverance. But if what they were struggling with running their mouth and cussing all the time is not a demonic activity, but a habit that they have been accustomed to over time. When they get born again today, they need time to be fully converted. They need to delete old files and save new ones from the word of God. Does it make sense? And so, so Simon was born again indeed, because I've heard people say that he was never really born again. No, he, he was born again. The Bible says he, among them that were saved, among them that believed and were saved was who? Simon the sorcerer. Now, let me tell you something about Simon the sorcerer. He looked at what was going on and he did not have the patience 
to wait for discipleship. He said, I want this and I want it now. So he went to Peter. He was like, you seem like the big dude. You're the big guy, right? I'm ready to pay you. Just name your price. Name your price. I'll pay you. And Peter looked at him and Peter was like, well, unfortunately for you, this is not how things work in the kingdom. He says to him, you shall have no part in this kingdom. It wasn't a curse. It was just letting you know that if you continue like this, there's no place for you here because the things of God are not purchased with money. When Elijah saw the gifts of the spirit, I mean, Isaiah, what did he say? He says, come and buy you who have no money because these things are not bought with money. So what do you do? The moment you get saved, you begin the process of conversion by leaving the temples of mammon, of God and of money. You leave those temples and begin to follow after God wherever he goes. You understand what I mean? And so if someone says, oh, maybe you can't just say that their prayers are not good prayers because they were not praying before. At least now they've changed. Where is the proof? The fruit of conversion is that you have to be translated. The Bible says that when the Lord brought us out of the Murray clay and set our foot upon the rock to stay, what did he do? He translated us into the kingdom of his dear son from out of the darkness. So when you leave the darkness, I need to see your translation. If Satan gives you a platform to promote immorality, when God saves you, God is more than able to give you a fresh platform. But people claim to have an, had an encounter with the Lord, but they're still using the tools that Satan handed them. I'm like, no, 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 don't get it twisted. There is no connection. The Bible says, what has light got to do with darkness? Because if we don't know these things, guess what? We will continue to take a cue from Satan because Satan is very skillful in the art of disguising himself as an angel of light. And that is the reason why the Bible says that we have been giving gifts. God has given gifts unto men, Ephesians chapter 4, so that we are not so easily deceived and so that we know when to stop desiring milk to go on to desire the sincere meat of the word. That is a process. You understand what I mean? And so here we are in the book of Joel chapter 2. Okay, I need to finish that thought. So we were here or we were there watching all this nonsense going on. And I was like, ah, this is, that is why, you know, we didn't come up here to say, oh, pray for the guy who fell. Because we're like, no. If we are to pray, it will be by the Spirit. The Bible says the holy men of old spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. Jesus warned us when he told his disciples, he says, every idle word that men speak, they will give an account. And so don't pray out of sympathy or out of obligation. You know, some of us, we don't know how to say no when people are like, oh, please pray for me. And you know that what they need is not prayer. What they need is just a little rebuke. But you're like, you're like, nope, not today. I'm just praying for them. You know, I met a man a while ago and he said to me, he says, he says, man of God, he says, I never pray for anybody unless the Holy Spirit says to pray for them. He said, even if I look at them and they're dying. And he meant it very seriously. Because I've seen him in church meetings where we're like, oh, we're just going to pray for these people. And everybody's like, oh, shuku, shuku, shamba, shamba. And then we just stand there. He may have taken his to the extreme, but there is something to learn, to learn from my dear brother Fred of beloved memory. Because he will not pray unless he has an unction within him. He says, because sometimes what, you know, he didn't say this, I, say, I said this around that time. Sometimes what we do is we give people false hope. When they put up a comment on Facebook and you put praying hands and you say praying. When, you, when people see that, they, they feel like, okay, people are praying for, for them. But in reality, you're not praying. You just put that up because you don't want it to show that you read the comment, but you didn't respond. You know how people send you messages and it says read. And so because they know that you've read it, you don't want to just go past and, you know, so what do you do? You put praying hands. In fact, some of us go beyond praying hands. We put the word, oh, praying for you. But that was not how Jesus operated. Jesus didn't say praying for you. He looked at Peter. He says, I have prayed for you. Don't feel under obligation to tell somebody you're praying for them. You can say, ah, well, I've heard. I will pray for you. At least they know that you haven't prayed. 
so that they're not going to relax. You know, because sometimes people feel a little comfortable and safe when they know that a team of prayer warriors are praying for them. Whereas those prayer warriors are not praying, they're just emoji warriors. They know how to throw all kinds of hands up, hands together, you know, many fires, because it's so easy to keep typing fire, 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 fire. Where is the fire coming from? Even you, the one that is putting up the fire, the altar of your prayer life is as cold as ice. But then pray in your hands and then you scroll. In fact, you look at how many times some people say praying, praying for you. On all these comments and I'm like, is this person a full-time intercessor? Because where have they found the time? They prayed on this comment. They, they were praying on that comment. They're praying. And then when you look at them, they're actually out in the park walking their dog and doing a story about it. And I'm like, wow, are you prayer walking? No, you're not. Because if you are, we would know. You see what I mean? And so we can't continue to give people false hope with the things that we speak. We need to mind our words. In fact, thank God for that example because one of the things that the Holy Spirit said to remind us of today is Jude 1.15. You know that on Saturday we read Jude 1.14 and the Holy Spirit said to me that we need to look at Jude because when Jude wrote Jude 1.14, to 15, he was quoting the chap the very first chapter of the book of Enoch, I believe verse seven. That was what he was quoting because it was written together. You understand what I mean? So let's quickly read that. Maybe that's what we'd actually read instead of Joel. You can go and read Joel on your own perhaps. It's got some interesting stuff. Okay, we're gonna end with Jude 15. Okay, so I say Jude 15 because there are no chapters. It's just one chapter, so Jude 15. Now look at Joel chapter two. The Bible says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Do I have everybody's attention? What happened a couple of days before the earthquake in Turkey? Do you remember when they went viral with several people posting about hearing trumpets but not seeing who was blowing the trumpet? So there was a cloud that was sitting over the, over the land. A cloud was sitting over the land and the cloud had an aura. Okay, so there is something about having aura. So to answer your question, one of those images that you sent to me, I have actually looked at it before, and the original appearance of that moon was a moon that came with an aura. And so when you see a sign in the heaven that comes with an aura, is indicative of the ministry of angels, right? And so it came with an aura, and they heard trumpets blown for days. And people would record it and post it. We don't know where these sounds are coming from. And so I told my brother, I said, there is something weird about this trumpet because he sent it to me, Pastor Ko sent it to me. I said, the trumpet is a call and response. I said, because there are two sounds that I am hearing. One is the trumpet, the other one is a groan. I says, the earth is groaning. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says that the earth is groaning as a woman in labor, waiting to give birth. And so I was hearing the call and response, but at the end of the day, you know, sometimes, you just look at things and you're like, hey, moving on. There's a lot going on in the world. So I moved on from it. It wasn't until later that I revisited that video and I thought to myself, wait a minute. These people saw the cloud of smoke, of fire, and of, the, and of blood, just as Joel said. And they also heard the trumpets and nobody did anything. And what is the trumpet for? It is a warning that something is about to be thrown out. Judgment is about to be thrown out. And it's not just about the people who live in that area. Again, certain places in the world have just been highlighted by God as like a, like a presentation board or like a screen. So what happens there is not just for them, it's for the rest of the world. They're just like a blackboard and God is using them as a sign to everybody else, okay? And so let's go. It says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand. Right? A day of darkness, I'm in verse 2 now, a day of darkness and, gloomin and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people, now this is where it gets very interesting because a lot of these signs are her heralding the coming of a people. They are people, but they're not like us. Now look at the description of these people and then you'll be getting some E.T. vibes here. 
One of the things that I noticed about the athlete that was prayed for was after he emerged from the ritual, one of his first appearances, in fact, at the recently concluded games, he wore an outfit that had all kinds of blasphemous things written there. Even, yeah, even G, they, they had somebody that was crucified, you know, which is, you know, in a way I was kind of happy when I saw that. And if you're wondering why I was happy that somebody was brandishing something blasphemous, I'll tell you. I am one of those people I've been kind of trying to warn people about, you know, brandishing the crucifix too much. You see, because of all the things that we could present as an emblem of our Lord and Savior, we present him hanging on the cross. When the Bible says that cursed is the one that hangs upon the tree. He was cursed for our sakes. He became a curse, literally. And that was when he was hanging upon the tree for just a brief moment. You understand what I mean? Because that was the moment of the wrath of God. And the Bible says the anger of God is but for a moment. Jesus was on the cross for a brief moment. And that is what we carry around everywhere in the world. You understand what I mean? There was one day I sat in a lecture. It was delivered by a Muslim cleric. I don't know how I got there. I was led to go there. And the guy was like, one of the reasons why he can never be a Christian is because Christians don't know who they are. He says, everywhere you go in the world, they're brandishing the sign of their oppressor. He said, because they keep showing Jesus on the cross. He says, and that is the Roman emblem for a curse. And the Bible even says in the book of Galatians that uh, Christ was made a curse for us who were the ones who were supposed to receive the end of God's damnation, but then he took it upon himself for cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. And so when he did that, in, in a way, it's a, it's a wake up call for us to recognize that we need to fully come out from among them and be separate to divorce ourselves from the pay of hollow tree. While we're prostituting ourselves in the temples of the Canaanite goddess, we picked up certain things as a reward for our prostitution. And what has God been telling us? God's brought us that word, I know, almost six times now in the last 18 months, that we need to give up the pay of halotry. We need to give up those things. And so when the guy came in and he had all of these blasphemous things, one of the things that caught my attention was the way they wrote eternal on the back of his shirt. It looks like they said, it is R. You know, it's almost like the ETs are here now. It, it looks like that. And I'm like, okay, well, we know the ETs are here. Maybe that's what it means or not. I, I can't tell you, but I know what the word of God says about the times that we're in. Is that the real time? Okay, we need to land this plane. Praise the Lord. Um, so verse two says, no, let's even move from verse two and go to where it says a people, which is to be, all right? A people come great and strong the like of whom has never been, okay? So we're not about to be invaded by other human beings because that has happened many times before, right? God forbid that another country comes to invade us now. Then that means somebody else needs to invade them because this judgment that is coming upon the earth is coming upon the whole land. So if somebody invades us now, that means we need to invade somebody else and they need to invade somebody else. It needs to be a chain and it will cause chaos, Right? And that's what has always happened in the world. It's called world wars. But this time around, it is us against them. You understand what I mean? This is the separation of the wheat and the tears. Okay? Remember that the people taught us while we we're growing up that we will be taken out first and then fire will consume the world. But you can't find that in the Bible. You can't find the rapture before tribulation in the Bible. No. You can't. It's not anywhere. You know, the Bible says with your eyes, you will behold the reward of the wicked. Jesus' parable was that the wicked, which are represented by tears, the tears will be gathered first and burned by fire while the wheat are watching. The wheat were still there on the field. You understand what I mean? And the reason why we got confused is because of the fact that we were given scriptures that had only abbreviations and summaries of the full prophecy. All the prophecies around the coming of the Lord Jesus, both what you find in 1 Thessalonians by, uh, chapter 5, a lot of what Jesus said in Matthew 24, a lot of what he said in Luke 17 and Luke 21, a lot of what John the Beloved said, a lot of the things that Jude said, they were arranged in chronological order by Enoch because he was the first to see it and he saw it in the order. And he said, he says the righteous because their foundation is strong, they will not be removed. He says, but the wicked will be swept away in God's judgment. And so we know that we're going to be here. When Daniel was prophesying about the great tribul tribulation, he said the saints were still there. He said because angel Michael, he saw the tribulation that was on earth. Now, let me help you resolve this issue because 
I had to go to the Holy Spirit because I, there were people who were trying to confuse us a while ago. They said Jesus was Michael. Jesus, they, you, you, I don't know anybody heard that. People trying to prove that Jesus is Michael because they said the name Michael is who is like God and there is no one like God except for the Son who is the fullness of the body, which is not true. They're trying to they're, they're jump into some conclusions. That is a complete fallacy. It's not even correct human reasoning. But one of the reasons why they kept saying that was because the Bible says that in Daniel chapter 12, that it was Michael who is the prince of God's people who came and says, come up. That he was the one that, the, that commissioned the rapture and everybody came to him. And prophecy says that we're going to be caught up with the Lord in the skies. Now, John resolved the issue for us and we didn't even know. The Bible says that when John was speaking, he says the Lord will come in the blue skies, all eyes will see him and the ones who are dead in Christ will rise first and then others will join him in the skies as he speaks with the voice of the archangel. So even though it was Jesus, the voice that was heard was the voice of the archangel. Case closed. You understand what I mean? So in Daniel chapter 12, it was Michael who spoke, but he was speaking on behalf of the Lord Jesus. So we're not getting caught up with Michael. Michael is part of the entourage. We're getting caught up to meet the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. And so Daniel said, Michael got up and it was like, guys, sound the trumpet. This is too much. We cannot take this anymore because they saw tribulation upon the earth such as have never been seen. So let me explain this. The earthquake that we saw in Turkey, even though almost 40,000 people have been reported dead, is still not the worst earthquake that we've seen. In 1915, remember in Japan, 100,000 people died and that was kind of like within a few hours. Right, And so this thing has to be escalated a notch to get to the point wherein it will qualify for tribulation that has never been seen. And the way that is going to happen is because it's going to be performed by an army that has never been here before. Do you remember about a year and a half ago while we were still in the basement? One day my, myself, my brother and Alan, we were having a, a, a conference call on WhatsApp. And my brother just started to scream. Himself and Alan, I don't know who was screaming the loudest. They were seeing all kinds of things. I was there getting entertained. And my brother was like, can you see them? Can you see them? Alan was there. Oh, shoo, 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 boo, boo, boo. And my brother, we were like, okay, dude, what are you seeing? He said, I am seeing beings upon the earth and I am being told that they've never been here before. Do you remember that conversation? And Alan bore witness because he had called also to let me know that he was seeing a visitation. And so these are the beings that have not been here before and they're about to be introduced to us, but they will call them what they are not. They may say that they're from some outer space planet or from some galaxy and all whatnot. Please do not let them fool you. We know who they are. They are a special force. They're special forces commissioned to remove the wicked from the earth. Now let's just quickly read this and then we'll close the gates. Um, the Bible says... Um, people, people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been seen, nor would there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run, with a noise like chariots over mountain tops, they leap like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble. You see, what do they do? They devour the stubble. In fact, I don't have time to break it down, but one of the words used here in describing this place is the same word that, was trans that is translated reapers. They're coming like fire to destroy the stubble. What did Jesus say would happen to the tears once they have been harvested? They will be destroyed by fire. And Jesus said in the parable that the servants of the landowner wanted to separate the wheat from the tears. And the landowner said to them, can you tell the difference between the two? Do you know that they look almost exactly the same? If you've seen, you can Google it when you get home and look at the, 
Say Google it because I don't see farmers here who may know the difference, right? But just Google it. Look at the images, the wheat and the tears. They're so similar that it's not very easy to know the difference. So Jesus said, the owner of the land said to his servants, don't you worry about trying to separate them. He says the reapers will come and do the separation. Jesus said that. That the reapers are coming. Okay, and so here are the reapers and they will come and they will devour the stubble, the stubble like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people wreathed in pain, all faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another to let you know that they're not human beings. Because human beings, no matter how well regimented we are in the day of trouble, we push each other. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they launch between the weapons, they are not caught down. If they are caught, if they are caught between fire, between torpedoes or whatever they call missiles, they just keep going. They are immune to our human artillery. So all of the lion wonders, anything that we can currently shoot down is only a mirage. When these people come, the Bible says we will not be able to shoot them down. So why are people telling us that they're shooting things down? Without condemning in anybody's office, what we need to recognize is the Bible says that in the last days, there will be signs in the heavens of what? Of cloud, of blood, of smoke, and of what? Lying wonders. Right? And so there's a lot of lying wonders that will come first so that we can discredit the, the army that the Lord is sending to remove the wicked. Why would they do that? Because the wicked know that there is an army that is coming to destroy them and they want to amass their own army ahead of time and they want to recruit human beings to do so. Now, let me say this very quickly. I'm not going to dwell on this very much, but let me tell you something. One of the things that the, the fallen ones, you know, when, when Satan was cast down to the earth, it was cast down with the thought of the angels of the heaven. One of the things that I've been given the privilege of seeing is they have been creating weapons and ammunitions. But because they are not of our kind, they only make munitions of their kind. And that is the, one of the main reasons why they want to change the DNA of humanity so that people can use the weapons that they have created. They are trying to turn the people to be like them. How do I know that? For us to be able to fight in Jesus' army alongside with him, we have to first of all be like him. Jesus is not marching in from glory with brother Matthew as he is now fighting in that army. He says, no, let them be caught up first. Let them be changed and then let them come back to fight. And so Satan, who does not have anywhere to take people to, is trying to use technology to change people's DNA so that they can handle the weapons with which they will fight this army when this army comes. This army cannot be cut down by missiles that are made by men. Governments are getting ready to show us weapons that they have been building, that they have not used, but in reality, they didn't build them. It was handed to them in their modified states. Don't worry, when these things begin to unfold, you will, you will be reminded that you are one of his prophets because he has revealed it to you ahead of time. Praise the Lord. Anyway, I said I'm going to wrap up and my wife hasn't even texted me. Maybe I should keep going. So the Bible says... Um, now look at what happens. They run to and fro, this is verse nine, in the city, they run on the wall, they climb into the houses, they enter at the windows like a thief, right? The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, which is Matthew 24. So you see that when you look at all of these things, they are happening at the same time. And these accounts just give us details of what Jesus was saying in Matthew 24. These are the guys that will be responsible for the blacking out of the sun by the chaos that they create. And that is the reason why the Bible tells us about Napoleon that is also going to be released. Napoleon, which is, the, the, is called the angel of destruction. Right? Also called the angel of death in some places. It, we, we kind of think of them as the same person, but that's story for another day. And when he is released, where is he going to come out of? It's going to come out of the old temple of Apollyon, which is current day Switzerland. If you know, you know. And that's where the, God, the angel of destruction is going to come out of. Do you know that um, 
we, the Bible says in, in, in Jesus was speaking to, I mean, the, in the revelation of John, John was told where Satan lives. He says Satan has his throne. He lives where Antipas was martyred. So when Antipas was crucified, he was crucified in modern day Geneva. And he's there in the Bible, but they changed the names of these places, you know, so that you can't really know what's going on. But thank God now we're no longer as unaware as we were. Anyway, last thing, and I'm going to tell you a quick vision and then we're going to close out. The Bible says that all of these things are going on. And in verse 11, the Lord gives voice before his army, which is what we talked about already, which is the voice of what? The archangel. So Michael is commanding, Michael is the voice commanding his army, but he's commanding this army on behalf of the Lord. That is the reason why you find two accounts in the Bible of how Satan was kicked out of heaven. One account says Michael kicked Satan out. Another account says the Lord kicked Satan out. And this is how it happens. It is the Lord doing it, but he uses the voice of the archangel. Does it make sense now? Alrighty, now, okay, I wanted to teach you this another day, but I'm gonna just quickly tell you. What I'm saying, which I hope you would have gotten, is the fact that where the word of the king is, there is power. If you can sound like God, you will command the army of heaven. So anything that the Lord is doing, he wants you to sound it out. He has given you the authority, but we would get to that another day. So what does the Bible say here? That the Bible gives, I mean, the Lord gives the voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. I just said that, right? When you execute the word of God, you have strength, right? And um, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Okay, alrighty, God is good. And my wife says, since you were waiting for the text, okay, yeah, and I got it. Alan had a vision. Was it Wednesday night when you saw the half moon? It was Tuesday. Well, a couple of days ago. He saw a moon and it was a half moon, a perfectly half moon. And when, when he said it, when, when he shared it with me, I, I just said, next, because I knew that there was more that he wanted to share with me. And then I took that before the Lord. And the Lord showed me very clearly what that was. He says the time has now been divided into light and darkness. Remember that in the beginning, when God says, let there be light, there was light. And the Lord saw that the light was good. And then he separated the light from the darkness. The darkness and the light coexisted like the yin and yang. They were together. And now we have come back to the same place now, wherein the light and the darkness exist and there is a dichotomy between them. Now, the significance of that is this. Everything that I have described that we have just read in the book of Joel chapter 2 is the same thing as Daniel chapter 12, the first part of it, and the same thing as Matthew chapter 24. It's, it's the same thing as Revelation chapter 6. What does that mean? All of these things will only happen in the darkness. When you are of the light, no evil will come near you. You understand what I mean? Can I explain that again? So in the midst of all of this chaos, this is not different from Exodus. When the land of Egypt was in darkness, but the people that were in Goshen had light because their light had come. And so death did not execute anyone in the light, but it took the firstborn in the dark, right? And so all of these things, as terrible as they are, they will not happen to you and I if we remain in the light. And what does it mean to remain in the light? The Bible says that in him was life, the word of God, and that life was the light of men. They that sleep, sleep at night. So if you are sleeping, you have embraced the darkness. But if you are awake and you're sober and you're vigilant and you are praying and confessing the word of God and speaking, Speaking the word of God continually, guess what? None of what is happening in the darkness will come to you because you are living in the ambience of light. Jesus says those who walk in the light will not stumble, but the ones who are in the darkness will stumble. So what does that mean? Even though all of these things are going to happen in the world, 
there could be an earthquake where you live, everybody's house could sink, but yours will remain standing because you are in the territory of the light. The world is so mixed right now that the way God is going to do the separation is not going to be geographical separation. It's not going to be economic separation. It is only going to be a separation that is based on light and darkness. There are pockets of light that have been marked by God before this army was released, right? Because, you know, the instruments or the elements that this army will use is already being controlled by the four angels. The four angels who hold the winds of destruction are the ones who are the armor bearers for this army. The implement they're going to use is in the hands of those guys. And those guys were told not to release the weapons until the, the, the saints have been sealed. And what is the seal of the saints? the light because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of truth is our seal unto the day of redemption. So we have that seal if we are led by the Spirit, speaking the truth. Enoch said it, Jude repeated it. What did Jude say in Jude 15, which I said we're going to close with, thank you Holy Spirit. I nearly was rushing to the point of missing it, but I want us to look at it very closely and then we can break bread and finally let Laura go home. So here we are. Jude 20, Jude 15, right? How is that? Okay, good. Maybe one of these days we'll have like microphones for people to read the scriptures from where they're sitting. Oh yeah. And so Jude 15, what does it say? Let's even read from verse 14 because it's so nice. It says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints, which we talked about the other day as innumerable um, saints, to execute judgment on the godly. So if you're, if you're looking for a scripture to support my interpretation, go back to Joel chapter 2 and you will see the Bible says great was the number of their chariots. They didn't even bother naming them. They just said it was great. In another place in Psalms, it was called 20,000. The word 20,000 means myriad in the Hebrew language. So by all standard, they are more than the enemy. So because when the enemy left heaven, they only left with a third. Two thirds still remain. So they are outnumbered, not us. They're just trying to make us feel small. Alrighty. I can't remind you of this thing enough. It's powerful revelation. If you get it, you have the boldness. Verse 15 says, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their what? Ungodly deeds, right? Which they have committed in what? In an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which they which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So what are the things that determine whether you're in the light or in the darkness? Ungodly deeds in an ungodly way by ungodly speech. So what does that mean? Your conversation has to be that of a believer. Whenever you feel the need for anything, confess that the Lord is your provider. Remember when we're in the season of looking up, you look up by physically looking up, you look up by looking up the prophecies of the ones who were in prison, just like one Sipphorus who was called the profitable one. And you also look up how? By looking unto the Lord who is your help because the Bible says, I will lift my head up to the hills from whence come my help. And so the Lord is saying, I want you to confess that I'm your help. These sinners are going to be destroyed because the fact that they were looking onto themselves for help keeps them in the dark because they shut out the light. When you open yourself up to the help of God, you are illuminated with light because he is your light and the Bible says is the glory and the lifter of your head. So you speak the word of God, you remain in the way. What is the way? The, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. You remain in Jesus. How do you remain in Jesus? By continually believing in, believing in all that he is. You understand what I mean? And then the next thing is what? Ungodly deeds. The Bible says that the unbelievers, their works will be destroyed because it is an abomination to the Lord. But you, the righteous, bear good fruits. You understand what I mean? So we need to focus on bearing good fruits. We need to focus on exercising patience, long-suffering, self-control, all of those things that the Bible called the fruit of the Spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When we can abide in these three things, we will be moving in the aura of light, in the ambience of light. And none of what happens in the world will happen to us. Even if there are no foods on the shelves, they will somehow appear where you live. So these are not times that we are afraid of because they're only terrible for the children of the world. For additional reading, 
go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, verse 4, and you will read about the dichotomy between the, actually start from verse 2. Verse 2 talks about the fact that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, but by the time we get to verse 4, it says, but for you who are of the light, it will not be as a thief in the night because you already know your season. And what is the meaning of that? Some are in the dark and you are in the light. Isn't that awesome? Let us break bread. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty. So, we're going to break bread today. And um, if I let's just break bread with that first Thessalonians, since we're already thinking about it, I think it's going to help release our faith even more quickly. So, first Thessalonians chapter 5. Okay. Corinthians and Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians. The Salonians, Timothy. Okay, there you go. For some reason today, I don't know where my brain is. Um, but here it is. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And it says in verse 1, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance. Paul says, I don't have to write to you. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit. And it reminds you. And so I want you to make a fresh connection with the Holy Spirit today as we break bread. Because Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. What is the power of remembrance? Or who is the power of remembrance? The Holy Spirit. So basically, Jesus was telling them, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in the Holy Spirit. Because he is the one that brings to our remembrance. And so as we break bread today, as we eat of the Lord's body, because the bread, we declare his body, the wine, his blood. So as we say this bread is the body of the Lord Jesus and this wine is his blood, as we eat of his body and his blood today in remembrance of him, we ask to be brought in closer with the Holy Spirit. We ask to abide more intimately with the spirit of truth who comforts us in all things, who teaches us and brings to our remembrance all that Jesus said and also reveals to us what is in the heart of the Father. Holy Spirit, we cannot make it without you. That's why you are called our seal unto the day of our Lord Jesus. And when that day comes, the Bible says, even beyond that day, he remains this seal. We thank you, Holy Spirit, because you will bring to our remembrance all of what we need to do, how we need to comport ourselves, the words that we need to speak, how we manage the hope and the faith that carries us through to the other side. We need you, Holy Spirit, particularly in this time, so that we do not walk in the dark. Because every time you bring the illumination of the word of God to us as a fulfillment of your ministry, even the ministry of remembrance, we are illuminated and ignited once again. We need you, Holy Spirit. Please remain with us and help us not to grieve you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. We'll remember you, Jesus. Praise God. Alrighty. So, folks, I just want to encourage you. Uh, clear your schedule and make sure that you catch up with this message again on is it Wednesdays or Thursdays? Thursdays, good. On Thursday, please catch up with it again. I said a lot of things very quickly there. So words said very quickly need to be listened to again. Alrighty, so I'm just going to hand off to Alan to close out the service and say a blessing over the offering. And I just want to say thank God for you guys, you know. No, Alan, you can keep coming, yeah? Because it's not very typical that you have people who would endure like a full hour of teaching. You know, because the Bible says in the last days, men will develop itching ears and will no longer endure sound doctrine. You see, but for those of us who make the sacrifice, who pin ourselves down, even when sometimes we're struggling to stay awake, we will be duly rewarded in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. Stay in the light. Praise God. Hallelujah. What a time. I told, uh, I told the man of God that, look, these messages as of late have been like five messages in one. And it's just the time we've come to. The time is shortened. 
And so we're getting all we can get as time permits. We give God praise. The given details are on the screen. We'll give everyone a couple of seconds to tap in there to worship in our giving. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for this time of ministry, how you have met with us, O oh God, how you have seen about us, how truly you reveal what's to come in our midst, O oh God. For your word declares that you won't do a thing without first revealing it to your sons, the prophets. Lord, we thank you for this equipping by your word, O oh God, by the Holy Spirit, which leads us into all truth. Father, we thank you for the seed that you have granted unto us, for we know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. The fullness of the earth is yours, O God. Lord, let these offerings be pleasing in your sight. Lord, be glorified in them. And Father, we thank you for you indeed are our provider for your word declares it. And Lord, by your Holy Spirit, it has been revealed to us. Now, Lord, let us run with this revelation of who you are. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. Family, we'll be back at it tomorrow, Wednesday, Instagram Live, 9 p.m., tapping in in prayer. And we'll see each other again also on Saturday for our meeting there, 630. Everyone, have a blessed night. Thank you.